Will future hackers be able to hack your brain and steal your thoughts and memories like in the movie Inception? Today we talk about cybersecurity of brain-computer interfaces. We all remember at the end of August the widely discussed Neuralink presentation where the company demonstrated their brain-computer interface, more specifically a chip that can be implanted in the brain and link it to an external device like a prosthetic or a computer. The presentation sparked a lot of debate, and one of the hot topics was the cybersecurity one. Many people commented on the device security, saying that it could allow hackers access to our brain. Some of these people were probably joking, confident enough that this will remain science fiction. Others were not joking at all. So what's the deal? So let's start with some worrying news. Cybersecurity for medical implants is already a problem. In 2018, two researchers presented a video at Black Hat. Black Hat is an annual conference on cybersecurity. And in the video, they showed how pacemakers and insulin pumps, two types of medical devices that are implanted in the human body, these devices, they can be hacked. It is possible, for example, for hackers to send wrong commands to these devices, which has obviously a lot of health implications, possible health risks for these people. I mean, imagine a wrong command to a pacemaker. And this presentation wanted to raise awareness on cybersecurity flaws of implantable medical devices, and it succeeded at that. So if insulin pumps are not safe and pacemakers are not safe, what can happen if the act target is something so delicate and private like our brains? Basically two things and they deal with reading and writing the human brain. The first risk is that hackers might access sensible brain data like feelings and memories which are collected by brain implants. This data is in fact composed by all the neuronal impulses that are detected by the analog shots which are implanted in the brain or whatever recording device and solution is used to read the brain. We've seen Neuralink analog shots but in fact there are companies like Kernel and Openwater which are working at different kinds of devices. But for all these technical solutions the functioning is the same so the neuronal impulses are detected, the impulses are then converted in digital format which is readable by the computer and it, they can be hacked. But the second risk is even worse because the second risk is that there is an undesired stimulation of brain areas that are linked to the implant. Brain computer interfaces like the one provided by Neuralink can in fact stimulate the brain with targeted electrical impulses provided by the electrodes. And normally this is used to treat for example neurodegenerative diseases but a hacker could interfere with a device and send wrong commands like we have seen for the pacemakers, which obviously has very serious implications. So these are the theoretical risks about hacking brain implants, but what about the actual cybersecurity flaws? Well, during Neuralink presentation that happened in August, there have been some questions and answers about that. Some of the team members, some of the team members from Neuralink, they provided some insight about the data communication and specifically about the protocol that they're going to use to transmit the data, and the protocol adopted is Bluetooth. We see a clip right now. Yeah, so the current version of the implant that we have is using Bluetooth low energy radio. But why does Bluetooth matter? What is the problem with Bluetooth? Why are so many people concerned about that? So let's talk a little bit more about Bluetooth. Bluetooth is a wireless standard for data exchange. It is widely used on all of our smartphones, but also on headphones or keyboards, Bluetooth is adopted to transmit wirelessly data. It allows, in fact, wireless connection between two closed devices. Connection can be temporary, like for authentication, or it can be long-term, like for fitness trackers or similar devices. Bluetooth opens a very convenient but potentially dangerous communication channel between the two devices. Without appropriate data encryption, that encryption that is converting data in a format that is readable only by authorized users, third-party devices can in fact interfere in the communication and use the information for malicious purposes. Bluetooth generally is considered to be safe due to the short range, which ranges between a few meters or tens of meters, but vulnerabilities have appeared in the past. In 2017, for example, a security flaw named Blueborn was discovered, and this security flaw affected billions of devices, making them vulnerable to cyber attacks. Matthew Green, who is a cryptographer from John Hopkins University, claimed that the main responsible for these vulnerabilities is the extremely complex documentation of the Bluetooth standard. In fact, the technical details in this documentation are drowned in hundreds and hundreds of pages of specifications, making it very difficult for developers. Many developers circumvent this problem by creating an additional safety layer over the Bluetooth standard. But it's not a very optimal solution. 
In fact, users are advised to turn off Bluetooth when not necessary to avoid any issues, but while turning it off on a smartphone is a minor inconvenience, turning off Bluetooth for a brain-computer interface is not so convenient. Are you scared enough? Risk assessment is not a very fun activity, but it's necessary. But don't worry, because the scientific community has not watched from the sideline while Elon Musk was playing with his pigs. In the interesting 2019 paper, Cybersecurity in Brain-Computer Interfaces, State-of-the-Art Opportunities and Future Challenges, the authors analyze risks and countermeasures regarding BCI security, BCI is Brain-Computer Interfaces. The paper shows, in fact, they were not unprepared when it comes to cybersecurity for brain-computer interfaces. In fact, there have been already assessments on different countermeasures, different solutions. Some of these solutions are, for example, hardware-based. They mean they have to do with the actual physical nature of the device, for example, regarding the antennas. Neuralink device is in fact equipped with the antenna to transmit the data wirelessly. And a potential countermeasure would be to employ directional antennas. There is antennas that can transmit and receive only along specific directions, to avoid, in this case, external interferences. But another countermeasure could be, for example, and it is already adopted in cybersecurity, frequency hopping. Frequency hopping is a solution where data packets are sent on random frequencies to avoid unwanted eavesdropping. Other countermeasures instead are software-based, and they deal with how data is collected and transmitted. A research team from Biorobotics Lab of the University of Washington created a so-called BCI anonymizer, a device capable of filtering brain signals and avoiding collection of unnecessary data. So we talked about collecting the data, we talked about how to protect the transmission of the data, but then the data that is collected must be also protected from other parties, unwanted parties. And encryption of the data, because we're talking about encryption of the data, is something that has been also been discussed during Neuralink presentation. What is the security of the device look like? What kind of precautions are being take, uh, taken and what does the future look like for the security of the system? So for, first and foremost, uh, privacy and security are top priorities at Neuralink, um, especially given the sensitivity of the data that we're collecting. And one of the things that we're ensuring is to make sure that a lot of the interactions with the brain data is going to be encrypted and authenticated properly. And I think this has been kind of a sort of recurring theme, but one of the things that we have the ability to do at Neuralink is that we work on every layer of the product from chip design to source code. And it really gives us a unique opportunity to embed security as part of our design from the get-go. It was mentioned also that Bluetooth as a standard might be scrapped, might be replaced in the future by other considered safer solutions like Wi-Fi. Passwords to access these devices is going to be another hot topic because, of course, these passwords have to be as safe as possible and we know when it comes to users how passwords can be weak. For example, in 2020, NordPass, which is a password manager, reported how the most common passwords are still too weak. We're talking about password, we're talking about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And there have been studies on this. For example, in 2018, cybersecurity company Kaspersky Lab and the University of Oxford Functional Neurosurgery Group demonstrated the need for really solid passwords for brain implants. They showed, for example, the current medical devices have often very weak passwords because the doctors need to be able to access these devices very quickly, so they don't think that much about passwords, but this can be a potential very huge security flow. So, considering all of this, the big question is, why are we still talking about it? Why, if these devices, if these brain-computer interfaces are so dangerous, why are we developing them? I mean, let's just get rid of them. I mean, we don't want our brains to be hacked, right? But here's the thing, this attitude is in fact counterproductive because it ignores all the good that can come out of these brain-computer interfaces, like helping people with neurodegenerative diseases or people with severe disabilities. Risks are always going to exist, no matter what. We are never going to be 100% safe, and this is something that we have to take into account. 
for everything, not just for brain computer interfaces, for everything there is a cost benefit evaluation. We evaluate the cost of every single one of our actions. This goes also with technology. Every technology has a cost, every technology has a risk. So the real question is not, is there a risk? But the real question is, how can we manage with these risks? These technologies are already here. We cannot just panic. We have to be rational. We have to be cold-headed, level-headed, and tackle these risks to make these devices as safe as possible. Let me know then in the comment your opinion. Let me know about potential solutions that you might think about in terms of cybersecurity for these devices. I thank you very much for watching and I see you in the next video.